Good morning. Do y'all feel rested? Did you get that extra hour of sleep last night? Right? You feel good? Now, if you have young kids, I feel your pain because they were up early, weren't they? You wanted the extra hour, but you did not get the extra hour. Uh, if you don't know who she was, let me go ahead and the, the woman you just heard from her name is Pastor Kelsey Brandrehorst, and she is our fairly new pastor of Next Gen. Yes. And I'm super excited because you're actually in a few weeks going to get to hear her preach, and she's phenomenal. So I'm very excited for you to hear her. And uh, again, if you have a middle schooler or are a middle schooler, they meet over in our youth center uh, right after the giving component, and they've taken donuts or muffins or whatever. And yes, if y'all and the high schoolers wait till they're done so that they can go grab the trays of donuts or muffins. Um, our high school is meeting on Wednesday nights at 6.30, so if you have high schoolers and know of high schoolers, this is the place to be on Wednesday nights. We are in week three of a series on the Holy Spirit. This is our final week on the Holy Spirit, and I've been looking forward to talking to you about the topic for this morning. Before I do, let me share this. How many of you have, even right now, in your wallet, in your purse, gift cards with like a little bit of probably something left on it? Raise your hand. And you be, yes, raise them high, look around. Yes, look at your friends. Yes. Do I sound funny to you? Okay, I sound funny to me, and I want to keep just pushing through it, but it's making me a little, I'm just like I'm in a bathroom. I don't know if you've ever talked to someone. If, if they sound like me right now, you're talking to someone that's in the bathroom. You should know that. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but anyway. Okay. Um, I have in my wallet and in my purse a plethora of gift cards. Not full, not with the total, but with, you know, like 48 cents <laughs> on it because you used it once, or I used it once, and then I thought, well, I'm not gonna throw away. I mean, it's 48 cents. The next time I'm here, I'm gonna use the 48 cents, and then inevitably, I forget about the 48 cents. So, of course, as all things, somebody did a study <laughs> on this. Around two-thirds of American consumers have purchased at least one gift card, okay? Gift cards are most popular with teenagers. 98% of teenagers have purchased or received a gift card. Because y'all know you give teenagers gift cards, right? At Christmas. Yeah. Gift cards are the most requested item on Christmas wish lists since 2007. Most highly requested. 40%. 40%. Almost half of us do not use the total amount of the card. We don't use it. But according to estimates reported in the Journal of State Taxation, the typical American home has an average of $300 in unused or unredeemed gift cards. <laughs> Just like, yep, that's us. Three, if someone walked up and gave you $300 in cash, you'd be thrilled, right? But the average American household, $300 in unused gift cards. Now listen, between 2005 and 2011, $41 billion went unused in gift cards. $41 billion. Now, I feel like I've grown in this area, and so I was curious, like, what's the total amount that I have in my wallet of unused gift cards? So I did the thing that you never want to do, right? You got to call all the... You got to call them all. You got to call them all and listen to the computer tell you what your balance is on this gift card. So I did that, and in my wallet currently, I have sixty dollars and thirty-nine cents. Sixty over sixty bucks in unused gift cards. I forget I have them. Not used to having them. I used them once, out of sight, out of mind. There's another study. This is 
90% of Christians do not know what their spiritual gifts are. You have gifts that are in you, in your possession. And most of you, 87%, according to the study, either don't know what they are or might have some idea, but they're going unused, underdeveloped. Maybe you don't know how they function. Maybe you don't know how to use them. Maybe no one has ever talked to you about this before, that the Holy Spirit gives gifts. And they're meant to be used in totality and fullness. So I want to give you a working definition for gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's this. Supernatural abilities given to Christians to fulfill the mission of the church. Let's look at it again. Supernatural abilities. This is the best news you've gotten all day. Who did not want to be a superhero when you were little, right? You have supernatural abilities given to you by the Holy Spirit to fulfill the mission of the church. The first week of this series, we said that the strength of your spirit is dependent upon your surrender to the spirit. Last week, we talked about the strength of your spirit is equivalent to your willingness to be sanctified by the spirit, purified by the spirit. So surrender, sanctification, and here we are. In the third week, here's what I want you to hear me say. The strength of your spirit is a reflection of how you serve in the spirit. How strong you are, your power is directly dependent upon how you serve the God that gave you the gifts to begin with, the gifts of the spirit. But What are we supposed to do with them? If 87% of Christians don't really know what theirs are, or maybe they have some idea, but they don't really use them, or they've been hidden, and they don't know what it's supposed to look like, where do you serve, and what do you do? Well, I'm glad you asked. I want to begin, though, because I think this is really important, because as I've told you before, the Holy Spirit is a topic that while it's not talked about much outside the church, it's very much talked about inside the church. And debated. In fact, gifts of the Holy Spirit would be one of the most hotly debated things inside of the church. So before we move into what they are, I'd like to tell you what they're not. Let's just establish a foundation of what they are not. First of all, by the way, I, I don't know. I, I just, I know we have new people and I just feel like it's a good reminder. Remember, I preach better when you what? Talk back. That's right. That's right. Now, if you're at home and you're talking to the screen, you can just talk back all you want. If you're in the room, what that means is if you hear something that you like or resonates with you, you can say an amen or yes or, you know, I don't know what, you know, grunt or just, you know, nod or just say, you know, preach it. That's right. Whatever, you know, but this is like we can we can be interactive this way. All right. All right. So first thing it is not. Gifts of the Spirit are not natural talents. Let me give you an example. You're born naturally with some natural talents. You might be able to sing well. Maybe you're good with numbers. Maybe you're athletic or you're artistic. You have natural talents. Now, the gifts of the Spirit are when you're born again spiritually and you receive spiritual gifts. You receive gifts from the Spirit and you can continue to receive them through the duration of your life. It's not a one-time thing. The Holy Spirit gives gifts. So spiritual gifts 
complement natural talent. For example, an athletic quarterback with a leadership gift, isn't he far more powerful and effective? Yes. So the natural talent of athleticism paired with the spiritual gift of leadership marries and is far more effective. All right. Gifts of the spirit are also not only given to the elite few. You know, like the super Christians get the supernatural gifts. Not true. They're not just given to God's favorites, because that doesn't really exist. But, and sadly, a lot of Christian church cultures will elevate certain gifts and say, if you don't have that gift, well, then you're less important. And there are even some church cultures that will say, if you don't have a particular gift, you are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Also not true. The Holy Spirit gives gifts as the Holy Spirit determines. And the Holy Spirit loves to give every believer gifts. It is not just for the, you know, super Christians, whatever that is. I don't know that that's what they do, but, <laughs> you know, never mind my. Gifts of the Holy Spirit are also not, hear this, not necessarily a sign of spiritual maturity. I know a lot of really gifted people who are also incredibly spiritually immature. For example, I'm not going to name names, but for example... A politician with a leadership gift that is also unethical and power driven is a dangerous thing. Can we agree? Okay, so just because you have a gifting, that does not mean that you necessarily are using that for the benefit of God's kingdom. It's possible. Okay, uh, Judas in scripture, had a talent for managing money, was good with numbers, was set here, care for the finances of the disciples, but did not have the character to uphold the gift. And he betrayed Jesus. Okay? In fact, the Spirit's fruit that we talked about last week protects the Spirit's gifts. It is the character of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It is that that makes the power of the gifting so beautiful and so supernatural as it and the person moves to expanding God's kingdom by using them. In fact, in Matthew chapter 7, Verse 22, Jesus says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, which is a gift, and in your name drive out demons, which is a gift, and in your name perform miracle, many miracles, which is a gift. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. You can have a gift, but not be mature. Gifts are not a sign of spiritual maturity. Also, gifts are not fruits of the Spirit. A gift comes upon and is received, right? You receive a gift. A fruit develops within. A fruit is produced. As we follow and keep in step with the Spirit... As we allow the Spirit, as we talked about last week, to prune those things out of our lives that are unholy and unrighteous, and we become more filled with the Spirit as we're emptied of things of the world, 
That is the fruit. The gifts are something entirely. All believers are to have all the fruits. Not all believers have all of the gifts. This is a very important distinction. Fruit keeps you safe as you minister with your gifts, right? Gifts are what help you carry out the ministry while the fruit keeps you safe while you're doing it. Very well aware of this. I have friends who have been leaders in the church in some capacity, whether it's a volunteer capacity or a staff capacity, and their life blew up when their character and their fruit was not strong enough to sustain their gifting. I'm sure you've seen it in your life. You know people that you would say they're so talented, they're so gifted, right? But it's their character and the lack of the fruit of the spirit that keeps them from sustaining the strength of the gift. Unfortunately, we are people who really want to pursue the power of the Holy Spirit before the pruning of the Holy Spirit. (laughs) We want the power and the gifts before the fruit. When the Holy Spirit longs to work the fruit in us that we might bear fruit that can then sustain the gifts. The gifts of the Spirit are also not to be feared, which might sound silly to some of you, but to others it doesn't. There are some gifts lifted in scripture, listed in scripture that seem odd or strange, some that seem completely normal, but regardless, they are not to be feared. We all have different backgrounds, we all have different upbringings, different belief systems, and knowledge about spiritual gifts. Everything from I have no idea what spiritual gifts are to, to, all, all, to like an unhealthy level of teaching on spiritual gifts. Some of you have had so much teaching and an overemphasis on gifts, far less on the fruit. Some of you have had really weird encounters with people who claim they're using gifts of the Spirit. And even as I talk about it, you're thinking, oh, I don't know, it's going to get weird. Do you know that 1 Corinthians tells us that we should all desire spiritual gifts? Paul says, You should want gifts. In fact, you should go to the Lord and ask for gifts. He writes that explicitly. So now let's talk about what they are. If those are the things they're not, what are they? Well, the working definition again is that they're supernatural abilities given to Christians to fulfill the mission of the church. So let me give you three really quick things that they are. One, they are given. This is really important because sometimes we like to produce a gift that hasn't even been given to us. (laughs) Oh, I wish I could sing. My husband knows this because when he was a worship leader uh, at a church we were at prior, I'd be like, babe, I can totally do it. I can totally help out with worship to me. And he was very clear that was never going to happen. (laughs) Never, ever going to happen. Gifts are given. Number two, they are discovered. You discover them. You learn that you have them as they get revealed to you. It's a process and a journey. And number three, and this is so critical, they are meant to be used. They are given They are meant to be discovered, and they are meant to be used. So there are multiple passages in Scripture that list gifts, but I want to look at one that is probably one of the most commonly referenced. We're going to go to the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 6. We have different gifts according to the grace given 
to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So we've been using similar illustrations every week as we talk about the Holy Spirit, what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Thought we'd use white today, I don't know, seemed appropriate. Holy Spirit, white. I hear you, Diane. I know that's you. I know that voice. Let me explain to you what just happened. All of you had a different reaction to what I just did. Some of you leaned to the person next to you or at at the very minimum had the thought. I almost told you that was what's going to happen. I saw that coming. I knew it. You might have the gift of prophecy. (laughs) Some of you, even right now, you can barely hear me speaking because all you can think is, oh my goodness, please let me help you clean that up. Please, 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 please let me help you get that taken care of. You perhaps have the gift of serving. There's another group of you who thought, oh, Yeah, I've seen this, and I can tell you there's a much better way to do this. I've researched it. You might have the gift of teaching. Some of you are thinking, oh, that is so frustrating. I feel for you, Heather. You know, that happened to me one time. Don't worry about it. It's okay. It's okay. Watch this. And then you would be willing to throw milk on yourself just to make me feel better. You might have the gift of encouragement. Some of you might be thinking, oh, 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 well, no, 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 it's okay. I'm going to run out and get you more milk. In fact, I'm going to bring everybody milk and I'm going to put chocolate in it. (laughs) Gift of giving. Some of you are thinking, we can get this thing cleaned up in no time. You go get this, you go get this. I've got a vision to make sure this never happens again. Leadership. And then there are those of you, I love these people. Heather, my heart just sank for you when that happened. When it was falling in your lap, I I was just sensing your hurt and your pain. I am so devastated that you are going through this right now and how uncomfortable you must be. I'm with you. I'm with you in this spilled milk. Gift of mercy, I don't have it. But a lot of you do, right? A lot of you do have it. Now, I know, because some of you are so stressed out, you can barely function right now. <laughs> I get it. I just, I'm gonna stop the drip for you. Okay, if I stop the drip, is everybody okay? There we go. No more dripping. <laughs> You're welcome. Now, It's a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek example. You all know that's not a real test, right? Like, that's not real. It's just a little bit of an example. But my whole point is to say, we all have different gifts, different ways that we encounter the world and things that have been given us to us by the Holy Spirit in order to grow and expand the kingdom of God and fulfill the mission of Jesus. We all have them. Now, to be clear, while mercy is not my first response, it doesn't mean I don't have it. 
Just because something isn't your first response doesn't mean that you don't possess it. It just means it might not be your strongest gift. There are more gifts named in scripture than we can possibly talk through today, and they are given to you. You have them. You have them. Which leads us to then, let's talk more about what they're for. Okay? I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the what? Why is it given? Hmm? It is given for the common good. It is given to build up the church, to fulfill the mission that Jesus came to do. That is why gifts are given. No one elevated over the other. No one, well, that's evidence you have the spirit in you, but that is not, not, no. Everyone that is a believer is given gifts by the Holy Spirit. We should all desire them. And part of the fun of walking with the Lord is discovering them. It's learning what they are. The first reason they exist is to make a difference in the church. Do you know that your gifts do not just exist to make you money out there? I think that's what we think. That the things that God has put in us are solely to make us money which is not even remotely biblical, that that would be the first reason. It is to build up the church. It says for the common good. First Corinthians, again, continuing to read, starting in verse 12, talking about the church, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form what? One body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many parts. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. This is what's so fascinating. This is not my notes, but you know. When someone gets upset and, and says, well, I'm going to go or I'm going to leave the church, it doesn't mean that you're no longer a part of the church. Right? Because what is the church? The church is the people of God. It is not a building building. It's not an institution. It's the people of God. So if you're a Christian, whether you like it or not, you are part of the church. You're just in it. And we're all part of one body, and we're all a different part of the body. Verse 16, and if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I don't belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as who he wanted them to be. That's so important. Just as who wants them to be? He. Guess what? I don't get to decide what gifts the Spirit gives you. You don't get to decide what gifts the Spirit gives someone else. The Spirit decides who gives the gifts, and they are just as God wants them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Just like the human body, when you lose the use of one part, doesn't the whole body have to make up the difference? The whole body does. If you twist your ankle, don't you apply more pressure onto the other ankle? 
If you hurt your wrist, end up wearing some kind of a brace, don't you then have to rely on your other wrist far more? When you don't have use of one part of your body, the rest of your body has to make up for it. It's just what happens. It works the same in the body of Christ. If we don't all use our gifts for the growth of God's kingdom, it only hurts the body. It only applies more pressure on other parts. So you can deduce from that that when everyone is walking in their gifts and serving in their gifts, that is what makes us whole. That is what makes us healthy. When we're all living out and in what the Holy Spirit has placed in us. Let me challenge you. Don't just give your gifts away to everything else in the world without investing them in the only thing that lasts forever. And the only thing that lasts forever. The second thing that the gifts are. The gifts exist to make a difference in the world. In the world. You know, we can get so caught up in our small stories We can get so caught up in what's happening in our own lives that we forget we're part of something much grander. (laughs) You know there are believers all over the world, right? All, we are a part of something enormous all over the world. There are people that are gathered today in every country worshiping the Lord in some manner, in some form. We are part of something. We are called to make a difference in the world. The church is to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now that I've taught you how to do this, disciples, now you go. And then he said, and you're going to do greater things than you have seen me do. Are you kidding if you've read the New Testament, have you, did, have you read the things that Jesus did? If you haven't read them, have you been told what Jesus did? And then he says, he says, you're going to do greater things. Don't you want to see the greater things? Don't you know that the New Testament wasn't supposed to like end at Revelation and then no great things afterwards? Like that's it. It's just contained. The gospel was to go out. The disciples were given gifts. Every single believer after that was given gifts. You have been given gifts to make a difference in the world. Part of our problem as Christians and believers is that we get so caught up in our own story and we wonder why aren't people using their gifts to make my life easier instead of thinking, what gifts do I have that I might go serve? Because the strength and the power of your spirit is connected to the strength and the power of your serving. You want healing to speed up in your life? Spiritual healing, emotional healing, relational healing. Get outside yourself. Serve. Look at ways to give of yourself to another human being. When you get outside your own story and you get outside your own circumstances, That's actually what gives you better perspective of your circumstances. We can lose sight and lose perspective and even lose touch with what's really going on when all we're doing is wondering why other people are not helping us instead of why am I not helping other people? 
How many times have you prayed for someone else's problem when you could have very well met the need? Lord, please bring somebody to meet that need. We know you want to. They're in need, Lord. Just, you know, have your way with them. And he's thinking, you are the way. We're supposed to make a difference in the world. I have a quote I want to give to you. It's really profound. Are you ready? You might want to write this down. You can't be the hands and feet of Jesus if you're sitting on your butt. <laughs> Just gonna... Thank you. I worked hard on that. <laughs> How are you going to be hands and feet if you're sitting on your butt, right? It's logical. You know what else I know? A lot of you are working in jobs right now that don't allow you to use the fullness of your gifts. You're doing it to provide for your family. You're doing it to earn a paycheck because there are bills to pay and there is something noble in that. But what it does is it causes you to feel depleted every day. When you work a job that isn't life-giving to you and things are life-giving when you're working inside of your gifting, it can be very exhausting. There are avenues for you to use your gifts where you live and you lead. Lead your kids. Serve your coworkers or your spouse. Encourage your boss. Give to someone who needs. Volunteer to work with the kids here. There are ways and avenues that you can take your gift and use it in any environment because it's not about the task. It's about the serving. If you have the gift of giving, you have the gift of giving everywhere. If you have the gift of encouraging, you have the gift of encouraging everywhere. If you have the gift of leadership, you have it everywhere and it's super annoying when it's not there present and where you want to use it. You know this, whatever gift you have, you have it everywhere. And there are ways to use it, ways to let it grow no matter where you are. The third thing that gifts are designed for is to make a difference, not just in the church, not just in the world, but to make a difference in your life. They make a difference in your life. Uh, I haven't always preached. I think I, I don't, first time I was asked to preach, I was 32, 32. Working on a church staff, a senior pastor comes to me, I think you should preach. I said, I don't think so. <laughs> I do not think so. That sounds like a terrible idea. I've not ever done that, and frankly, I have no desire. I have no desire to do that. He said, well, I have a desire for you too, and so you're going to in two weeks. Hmm. He says, I think you have it in you. So two weeks go by, I've worked on this message. i am not slept in two weeks. I feel like I wanna vomit all the time. Right before the service, I've got my little headset on and I had to run into the bathroom, jerk it off my head and I threw up in the church bathroom. I mean, I'm not, when I say I was nervous and I didn't want to do it, I'm not exaggerating. I didn't want to do it. I'd never done it. I'm not going to be good enough. You got to talk for a really long time. Like just you, people are looking at you. I, I don't, anyway, so I get up. Get my little notes out. <laughs> People are sitting there. It's like, what do you do? You can't, you just can't go home. <laughs> if I decide not to do it, well, everybody knows now. <laughs> gotta do it, I got my notes, you know. I go through my first page of notes. I'm kind of like this, I'm shaking. I think everybody was praying for me. 
because, you know, I'm just, oh, you know. And then after the first page, after the few minutes, it was like something else took over. Like, it didn't occur to me in the middle of it. It occurred to me afterward that a few minutes in, all of a sudden, I was like, this feels easy. This thing that went from feeling impossible now feels easy. And when I got done, I walked off the stage, sat down next to Jeff, and I was like, I think I want to do that again. (laughs) Sometimes the Holy Spirit has gifted you with something and you have no idea that it's in you. I had no idea legitimately that it was in me. And sometimes it's somebody else calling it out in you. Sometimes it's that you have this little thing in you that thinks, oh, wow, I wonder, like, I wonder what it would take, like, to do that. That seems really interesting to me. Oh, but I never could. Sometimes it's in there. I had a mentor of mine ask me one time. She said, Heather, when you were a little girl, what did you just do for fun that nobody had to tell you to do? Like if you got, if you went back to when you were really little, before everyone else in the world told you what you couldn't, couldn't do, what were the things that you just did? And I said, well, you know, I mean, I, what, I used to like, I would go get all the neighbor kids and I would pull them into the neighborhood and I would say, okay, I have a plan. Like one time, uh, you know, I wanted to have a Olympics in our yard. So I gave everybody jobs. And then, you know, we went out and handed out little invites to all the other kids in the neighborhood and charged them 10 cents to come to our Olympics. One little boy didn't have 10 cents. He had like the plastic coins. And I said, I'm sorry, you have to go back and ask your mother for 10 cents. I was very serious about the vision. Another time, I mean, I, I, I don't know how many lemonade stands I had. I don't, and then if we ran out of lemonade, I would bake brownies and I would sell brownies. I mean, I was just always creating. I always had a vision and a plan. We did talent shows and I would assign, I would assign responsibilities. And then we'd come together and we would produce this thing. I was like, that's what I did. And she said, well, that's interesting. Look at what you're doing. Isn't it a vision? And then you pull people together and you say, hey, I think we can accomplish this and here's what we're going to do and I'm going to give you these responsibilities and you're going to lead the way forward. Isn't that what you do? Well, yeah, I guess. What did you do before someone told you what you couldn't do? Who were you at your most natural state? What was fun for you? What was enjoyable to you? Because I'll bet there's something in it. I'll bet there's something. Think about the moments even as an adult when you have walked away from that moment and whatever it was, you just had the most fulfilling, joy-filled experience. What were you doing? And I don't necessarily mean the task. I mean, who were you in that moment? Were you the leader? Were you the encourager? Were you the one serving? Were you the one giving? What, were, you the, were you the one teaching? Were you the, what were you doing in those moments? When you are doing what God created you to do, there is a confidence and a trust that is built between you and the Holy Spirit that is supernatural when you're in the pocket, because the strength of your spirit is directly connected to the strength of your service in the kingdom of God. So there are a couple of ways for you to discover what your gifts are. One, you should pray about it and ask the Holy Spirit to help you discover. Remember, they're meant to be discovered to help bring clarity to that. 
Number two, you should go to God's word. In fact, you can Google, super easy, where are gifts of the spirit in the Bible, and it will give you passages, and you can read them. You can read about the gifts of the spirit and begin to sit and ask the Lord, Lord, which of these resonates with me? And then you should also experiment. Experiment to discover what your gifts are. We would love to have you experiment with what your gifts are by serving here at Madison Park. In fact, there are a couple of ways that I would like to invite you into serving that are going to resonate not with all of you, but with some of you. As you can see, we're rebuilding a student ministry. And we need godly adults to willing to pour themselves into the lives of students. And see, even when I say that, people immediately go, oh, what, teenagers? I don't know. I don't know, man. You know, raising kids, people always warn me about the teenage years. Can I tell you that my teenage years have been the favorite with my children? Amen. They can have conversations. I like that. If you love Jesus and you can love people, you can love students. And a lot of you in this room have stories. Some of you think you're unworthy or you wouldn't be good enough. Listen to me. You have a story of redemption and restoration in your life. And you remember being a student? How many of you were awesome as teenagers? Anyone? Anyone? Like five of you? Yeah, great. I was not. But there were people that were willing to pour into me. There were people that were willing to just be a small group leader and sit and listen to me talk about my high school drama and love me anyway. People willing to say, hey, you know what? I see this in you. I see that in you. Hey, let me tell you my story and how I know that Jesus can make a difference. Student ministry, middle school, high school, consider it. Consider it. Consider worship. Do you play an instrument? Do you sing? Apparently you have to be able to sing, so I'm told. <laughs> be a part of it. Do you have a gift of hospitality or encouraging? Can you open a door as people come in and say, hey, I'm so glad to see you? If you can do that, you can serve or volunteer. Have you always wanted to be a barista? <laughs> you know? You want to be able to make the coffee? Baristas, it just sounds, you know, kind of bougie. <laughs> the coffee shop. You can work in the coffee shop. Free coffee. Free, like, pretty, like, really, like, floofy coffee. Right? <laughs> we have outreach. We work with partners in our community to serve them. You know, one of the things that we need, I could just go on a roll. One of the things we're looking for... Uh, Tanya, wouldn't you agree with people who speak Spanish? Wouldn't that be helpful? Mm -hmm. Because the Lord is opening up some opportunities for us inside of the Latino community, and we would, be able to, we would love to be able to serve them better. Like, can you speak? To, like, there are so many things that exist inside the life of this church that if we just knew about them, we could just do extraordinary things. Do you organize really well? How many of you are organized? I cannot tell you how many things there are that you could help with. There are just so many things. So, read the passages in Scripture about it. Pray and ask the Lord to reveal it and then experiment. Serve in a certain way. And you know, maybe you get four weeks into serving and you're like, this is not my thing. That's fine. That's fine. Then we find something different. But your gifts are in you They've been given to you. They are meant to be discovered. They are meant to be used for the mission of the church, for the, for the world, and for you. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, 
I think of the scripture that says, you give good gifts to your children. That you long and you want to give good gifts to your children. So Lord, I pray for those that are sitting here or listening to my voice online and they have gifts. Maybe they've been wondering how to use them or where to use them, Lord. I pray that even right now you would just sort of whisper, prompt their hearts to experiment with what it would mean to use their gifts. Lord, I pray that you would awaken gifts they don't even know they had. That there would be moments that occurred across our church body of us tapping someone on the shoulder and saying, hey, I see this in you. And then someone begins to use a gift that has been underneath all the layers, but you're longing to bring forth. Lord, may we be a church that claims our strength comes from (laughs) surrender, being sanctified, and serving by the power of the Holy Spirit. To you be the glory, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.